from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the award for Bre uh, Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. A current thematic unit is animals. This is segment one of episode 55. Our last episode was dedicated to OR7, a wolf that undertook an epic journey from eastern Oregon to northern California, becoming the first live wolf in California in 88 years. I introduced two books that I recommended for reading. There's another book about wolves that may meet the reading levels of many viewers, so I want to let you know about it. Now, for an easier and less artistic read than the earlier book I reviewed, I recommend this book from Scholastic Books. It's from their I Can Read series. It's entitled simply, Wolves. Now, this book for young readers uh, begins with a wolf howling. And, as in our last episode, the wolves in the distance answer. Now, Janice Kinley illustrates the book. Read the last two sentences. If they make sense to you, see if that's the case. The last two sentences here. Now see if you can read the words at the bottom of this page. We've talked about the characteristics of mammals, so you've probably heard about this before. Now this page tells you about a wolf's physical adaptations as well as details on how it eats its prey. The book is written by Janet Palasso Craig. These pages illustrate and explain the wolf pack as a family and explains the concept of social animals. The text is fairly simple and straightforward and illustrations give the reader context clues for finding the meaning of the words. The series name I can read about and this set is called Animal Hunters. Now, these are available only through the school market. You may be able to find some if you go to Scholastic Books. I'll have the ISBN on my website, letscreate.org, as well as a link to their website. In the review, I've shown only a few of the 45 pages in this book, Wolves, written by Janice Palasso Craig and illustrated by Janice Kinley. We'll be back with more of Ramping Up Your English after this. organization that's doing big time restoration of forests and stream banks. Hello, I'm John Letts, producer of Adventures in Education. Welcome back. Thanks to some great decisions by Congress and the dedication of U.S. Fish and Wildlife personnel, conservation groups, and Native American groups, North America now has wild wolves again. North America also has other canine populations living in the wild. Coyotes are extending their range throughout North America. Coyotes can live in a variety of habitats, even in urban areas. Now, I've seen a picture of a coyote on a subway train. They are highly adaptable and therefore increasing their range. Coyotes are often the prey of gray wolves, but some share wolf haven with their predators. And the famous wolf, OR7, 
ran with a pack of coyotes briefly during his epic migration. Now, while I've never heard the howl of a wolf, I'll never forget the coyote howl I heard just outside my tent that night in Hell's Canyon, or the distant reply that I heard. Now, another North American canine is the gray fox, much smaller than a gray wolf. This fox can climb trees. I've encountered one on a trail along the Rogue River. It took its sweet time leaving the trail, as if to tell me it wasn't doing so on my account. Since that brief standoff, I've seen fleeting glimpses of gray foxes at night. Now, with its convergence of biomes and habitats, southern Oregon is blessed with a plethora of wildlife, now joined by the rogue wolf pack. Even with all its celebrated megafauna, North America is not the only place to find animals living the wildlife. How about Latin America? All that incredible country from Mexico down through South America all the way to Cape Horn. The southern area of Argentina is known as Patagonia. This southern polar region is home of many interesting animals. One of them is the second largest rodent on Earth. It's called a cavey. Now, we get to meet one today thanks to Wildlife Safari in Winston, Oregon. Leela Goulet and Julianne Rose brought a cavey to the Digital Media Center for an appearance on Adventures in Education. Let's see that part of the program. If you look in a book like this one, you'll learn that the capybara is the largest rodent in the world. But what's the second largest rodent? I didn't need a book to answer that question. I met the second largest rodent last year on a TV program called Adventures in Education. My human guests were Leela Goulet and Julianne Rose from Wildlife Safari. Let's see what they taught us about cavies. So, looks like uh, this is an animal that enjoys her breakfast. <laughs> Yes, she's been waiting very patiently for her breakfast this morning. This has oh, been pretty good. <laughs> okay, so what can you tell me about this? Um, so this is Patty, and she's actually a Patagonian cavey. Um, they're native to South America, Patagonia to be specific, and they are the second largest rodent in the world. Wow. Yeah. So the, the first one being the... Uh, the capybara. Capybara, okay. Yes. Now... Uh, this, uh, what, what do you say her name was again? Her name is Patty. But Patty. She, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, um, Patty has, uh, what's her history? Um, she was actually brought to the park as a donation, and she's just been an absolutely amazing ambassador animal for us. We take her out on outreach, and um, she's able to be touched by the public as well, so it's a really great way to get hands-on with these animals, and she just has the perfect personality for it as well. I'm trying to get her little cooing sounds. That's why I'm leaning <laughs> forward. She, she's pretty much like a giant guinea pig with the way she interacts and her sounds and her diet. And and her diet actually doesn't smell so bad. It's, a, <laughs> it's kind of a, has a green smell to it. Yeah, and in the wild they would eat things like grasses and plants. And here at Safari we feed her some pellet mixture so that she gets the, the vitamins and minerals she needs. But she also gets fruits and vegetables that are high in vitamin C as well as some, some hay as well. And diet is very important for It's really, animals. it is. It's really important for all of our animals as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a, a part of the educational outreach. Yes. And uh, that's the reason you guys are on the show. Yeah, I, exactly. I found out, uh, first of all, that you, that, that uh, Wildlife Safari is a nonprofit organization. It is, actually, yes. Not a lot of people realize that. Um, and, and I think part of that is that, you know, you see signs for it, you know, billboards for it mm -hmm. on the freeway. You see people going in, and you might think, oh, well, this is a for-profit kind of thing. But actually, you guys are nonprofit. That's right. That's right. We have 600 acres there, and it costs around $12,000 a day just to run. So um, all of the proceeds that we get from admissions and donations and, and fundraising events, that's basically how we raise our money. So we're not at all city funded. So if you think that um, the entrance fee is steep, compare that to going to South America, mm -hmm. to Patagonia, 
you're probably going to pay six times that much just for the coat you're going to need in Patagonia, right? Because <laughs> it gets very cold down there. No, it's, it's a great way to get people to be really close with the animals and to really create that bond. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to see these animals any other way. You know, not, not many of us exactly can travel to Patagonia or Africa. Not, or not, on, my, uh, no. not on my retirement. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. Most rodents we're familiar with have scaly tails, but cavies have no tail at all. If you're a student in Oregon schools, you may get to meet this cavy. It's one of Wildlife Safari's ambassador animals, part of their outreach to schools. You can watch the entire episodes of Adventures in Education that features Wildlife Safari. Visit archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Find the sidebar and click on my name, John Letts. From there, you can select the Adventures in Education episode featuring Wildlife Safari. Both of these episodes were directed by Denise Ross, with Steve Dreben doing a multitude of technical tasks. My thanks to Leela Goulet and Wildlife Safari's Education Outreach. You're watching Ramping Up Your English from RVTV Voices. This is segment two of episode 55. We use a content-based approach in improving English skills. Now, although we got to see a lot of the cavey eating from a bowl, there wasn't a whole lot of visual context. Given that, how much of the video were you able to understand? While assessing yourself constantly can be counterproductive to overall our objective to improving your English, it is helpful from time to time to see if your skills in English are improving. Now, this calls for some honesty in two directions. The most obvious is the temptation to overinflate your ability. That could result in overconfidence, lack of motivation to undergo further growth. But less obvious is a tendency toward modesty, failing to recognize growth when it's occurred. Now, this can also sabotage motivation leaving you feeling frustrated and disappointed at your perceived lack of growth. Now, the system we use is highly subjective. That's its weakness. But if you dedicate yourself to being brutally honest about this process, you should get a good indication of your growth in English proficiency over time. So what is this process to which I'm referring? It's simply watching a video and indicating the percent of the content you understand. Now, if you understand this program at all, including what I'm saying now, you can't honestly say that you comprehend 0%. It's equally unlikely that you'll understand 100% of what you hear in the video unless you're already at a place of mastery. And if that's the case, you may not need to avail yourself to the help offered by this program, although you're certainly welcome to keep watching for the interesting content and engaging video. The idea of self-assessment is to watch a video and estimate the percentage of the narration you understand. Let's have you do that with the next video. Now, when I was in Villahermosa, Mexico, I saw this animal cross my path. Now, I thought it was an anteater, but I later learned that I had seen a coati. A few exist along the border with Mexico, but most of them live in Mexico, Central America, and South America's tropical and subtropical areas, including Brazil. They're especially at home in the forest. Now, coatis live in bands of about 40 females. They run off intruding males until the breeding season. That's when they'll accept one male to mate with the entire band. As for that cone-shaped nose, it uses that to scavenge in the crevices for small rodents and invertebrates as well as plant matter. As an agile climber, it also feeds on fruit. Let's watch this video and learn more about coatis. Coatis, pointed nose animals I once mistook for anteaters. I was in southern Mexico at the time, the lower part of their range, which extends north to the American Southwest. That pointed cone-shaped snout is what fooled me. Coatis eat berries, lizards, mice, and plants, not so much ants. These coatis live at wildlife images near Merlin, Oregon. 
Their diet helps determine one of Wildlife Image's educational outreach summer camp themes. Coatis are one of four animals that teach young campers about the dietary needs of animals at this rehabilitation center and the importance of diet. Campers pass animal enclosures on their way to preparing meals that are healthy for the animals. They're already learning about coatis as they approach the tent where they'll learn to be animal chefs. Inside the tent, the campers put on gloves, keeping the human scent away from the animal's food. Everybody got your gloves going on? All right. Campers listen to instructions, learning what they'll be doing in the tent. What are you guys doing? The coatis. Do you guys remember who the coatis are? The wolves. The coatis are those little oh, guys that we just passed on the way down here. They actually kind of look like, some people think they look like an anteater. They have that big long nose and a really big long tail. Um, we are going to make diets for them and then we have a really special thing that we get to do with them. We get to go into their enclosure while they are in what we call their safety. The area where they sleep and they're in there right now. And um, because they're in there, they're safe and we're safe. And we get to go into their enclosure and we get to put their diets in their enclosure and kind of hide them in different spots. And then we'll be able to watch them go in. We'll let them out of their safety and we'll be able to watch them go in and, and hunt for the food like they would in the wild. To mask the scent of humans in the Kawadi enclosure, feathers are sprayed with a scented mist. So very little animals, animal scents so are much stronger than ours, so we only spray a little bit. Okay, we'll start with okay. the animals. Okay. The campers gather dandelions for the animals. The Kawadi group is excited. They've gathered grapes and other food, and they're ready to feed the Kawadis. All of the campers leave the tent and proceed toward the Kawadi enclosure. The Kawadi group enters the enclosure. Their campmates watch while they strategically place the food they've prepared. Yeah. So, all right. With the food packed away, the kids leave the enclosure. Yeah, when everybody's out, we'll open it. Oh, cool. Okay. The Kawadis are released from their safe house into the enclosure where they seek out their breakfast. The children watch excitedly as the Kawadis find the food they so carefully placed in the enclosure. Oh my god, oh, it's getting... He found my green... Wait, he found my blackberries. No, he's finding my food. He found my food. No. Oh, I see the leaf. I'm gonna go in there. Nobody has got my food yet. Oh, oh yeah. Well, yeah. Bubble tea. Okay. Mm. Oh, he's found a grape. Get it. You have never found that yet. Yeah. They will soon. They're not even eating the apples. It is, but not right now. Yeah. yeah. It's not turned on, but it is on. You know already. <laughs> Kawadis are found in the American Southwest, and they range as far south as Central America. A kawadi's tail is typically as long as its body. That helps them balance while climbing. You can see these kawadis and numerous other animals at Wildlife Images. For over 35 years, Wildlife Images has rehabilitated animals that are injured or otherwise in need of help. They plan even more educational outreach.
You're watching Ramping Up Your English on RVTV Voices. This is segment three of episode 55. I'm your host, John Letts, and today we're looking at animals that live in Latin America. Now, having seen how the campers at Wildlife Images prepared food for the coatis there, this is a good time to look at another part of the report you're doing on animals, that being diet. Now, the common use for the word diet in today's world has more to do with what people don't eat than what they do eat. Well, when used in animal science, however, it refers to what an animal eats. In the case of the omnivore, like the coati, co those menu items could be plants or animals. This is part of what the wildlife card has about the coati diet. As an opportunistic feeder, coati seem to eat whatever is in their habitat to eat. This is the same adaptability enjoyed by raccoons as explained in the previous episode on habitat. This flexibility is one reason why coatis are so widely distributed in Latin America. Now, I can't possibly leave Latin America without the animal that intrigues me the most, and that is jaguars. This is America's largest cat and South America's largest carnivore. Jaguars are night hunters, stalking their prey, pouncing on them, and then killing them with its pointed teeth. Jaguars can roar. Did you know that? They can roar. Uh, and that can be heard over great distances. They're also not afraid to swim in water. Jaguars are apex predators, but their populations are shrinking due to, be, uh, due to being killed by humans and due to habitat loss. Native Americans like the Olmec, Maya, and Aztec revered the jaguar. Their warrior society, sometimes wearing jaguar pelts into, bio, into a battle, the likeness of jaguars are often seen on the architecture of ancient cities. Some giant Olmec stone heads are carved with jaguar features. Jaguars are the apex predators, mostly at home in rainforests. As hunters and eaters of other animals, jaguars are carnivores, meat eaters. Now, if your home language is Spanish, this is easy to remember. Think of the carne you buy at the meat market for the carne asada you're cooking up for the festival. Diet information for your report also includes how the animal gets its food. This information is also found on the wildlife card under food and hunting. These sketches illustrate the jaguar using an ambush to attack its prey. And these illustrate what it does with the prey after it's killed it. An encyclopedia would have the same information, perhaps in greater detail, so would Wikipedia. If you look at the end of a Wikipedia article, you'll see the sources that are used, and that may be a perfect way to find a book that has more details about your chosen animal. If you live in Latin America or travel there, you're likely to see a coati or even a cavey if you go all the way down south enough, but your chances of seeing a jaguar in the wild are exceedingly rare. They go to great lengths to avoid being seen by people, and they mostly hunt at night. My jaguar footage comes from a zoo in Villahermosa, Mexico. There was a pretty sturdy fence between me and that animal with those huge, sharp canine teeth. And with that image, we're nearing the end of this episode. I hope you wrote down the percentage score for the Kawadi movie. Be sure to add the date and the episode, which is 55. I recommend keeping these self-assessment pages in your notebook along with the first draft of your report. I would love to hear from more viewers to see how this program's working out for you. I have a new email address for easier communication. You can reach me at letscreatepro at gmail.com. Visit my website at letscreate.org to find the episodes of Ramping Up Your English by episode number. Visit that page and you can follow the link from there to the archive of the episode. You can watch and even download all episodes of Ramping Up Your English at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Use the search box by entering Ramping Up Your English. You'll find all the episodes there. Ramping Up Your English can be seen in Ashland on channel 15 of the Ashland Home Network and in the rest of Southern Oregon on Charter Cable channel 182. 
Showtimes are 8 a.m. on Mondays and 7.30 p.m. on Thursdays. Showtimes will vary in different areas. Check your local public access and education stations. I want to thank Leela Goulet and Julianne Rose of Wildlife Safari for appearing on the Adventures in Education, allowing me to videotape their animals. I also want to thank Wildlife Images for allowing me to videotape their summer campers and, of course, videotaping their animals. I want to acknowledge photographers who license their photos under Creative Commons license. I also want to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Oregon Fish and Wildlife for use of their photos. I also want to acknowledge International Masters Publishers, creators of our source material. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and my talented and loyal crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you helped to make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.